Chapter 2, 1911, The Crisis of Agadir On the idle hill of summer, sleepy with the sound of streams, far I hear the steady drummer, drumming like a noise in dreams. Far and near and low and louder, on the roads of earth go by, dear to friends and food for powder, soldiers marching, all to die. In the spring of 1911, a French expedition occupied Fez. This action, added to the growing discontent in Germany over the Moroccan question, tempted the German government at the beginning of July to an abrupt act. The Brothers Mannesmann, a German firm at that time, very active in European financial circles, claimed that they had large interests in a harbour on the Atlantic seaboard of the Moroccan coast and in the hinterland behind it. This harbour bore the name of Agadir. Herr von Kindelen Wachter, the German foreign minister, raised this point with the French. The French government fully realised that the advantages they were gaining in Morocco justified Germany in seeking certain colonial compensations in the Congo area. The German press, on the other hand, was indignant at exchanging German interests in the moderate climate of Morocco for unhealthy tropical regions, of which they had already more than enough. The questions involved were complicated and intrinsically extremely unimportant. The French prepared themselves for a prolonged negotiation. So far as the harbour and hinterland of Agadir were concerned, there seemed to be no difficulty. They denied altogether the existence of any German interests. They said there was only a sandy bay, untouched by the hand of man. There was no German property on the shore, not a trading establishment, not a house. There were no German interests in the interior. But these facts could easily be ascertained by a visit of accredited representatives of both countries. Such a visit to ascertain the facts, they professed themselves quite ready to arrange. They also courted a discussion on the frontier of the Congo territories. The Panther at Agadir Suddenly and unexpectedly, on the morning of July the 1st, without more ado, it was announced that His Imperial Majesty, the German Emperor, had sent his gunboat, the Panther, to Agadir to maintain and protect German interests. This small ship was already on its way. All the alarm bells throughout Europe began immediately to quiver. France found herself in the presence of an act which could not be explained, the purpose behind which could not be measured. Great Britain, having consulted the Atlas, began to wonder what bearing a German naval base on the Atlantic coast of Africa would have upon her maritime security. Observing, as the sailors say, when they have to write official letters to each other, that such a fact must be taken in conjunction with German activities at Madeira and in the Canaries, and with the food routes and trade routes from South America and South Africa, which converge and pass through these waters. Europe was uneasy. France was genuinely alarmed. Sir Edward Grey's Warning When Count Metternich apprised Sir Edward Grey of the German action, he was informed that the situation was so important that it must be considered by the cabinet. On July the 5th, after the cabinet, he was told that the British government could not disinterest themselves in Morocco, and that until Germany's intentions were made known, their attitude must remain one of reserve. From that date until July the 21st, not one word was spoken by the German government. There is no doubt that the decided posture of Great Britain was a great surprise to the German Foreign Office. There ensued between the governments what was called at the time the period of silence. Meanwhile, the French and German newspapers carried on a lively controversy and the British press wore a very sombre air. It was difficult to divine from the long strings of telegrams which day after day flowed in from all the European channels. What was the real purpose behind the German action? I followed attentively the repeated discussions on the subject in the British cabinet. Was Germany looking for a pretext of war with France? Was Germany looking for a pretext of war with France? Or was she merely trying by pressure and uncertainty to improve her colonial position? In the latter case, the dispute would no doubt be adjusted after a period of tension, as so many had been before. The great powers marshalled on either side, preceded and protected by an elaborate cushion of diplomatic courtesies and formalities, would display to each other their respective arrays. In the forefront would be the two principal disputants, Germany and France, an echelon back on either side at varying distances and under veils of reserves and qualifications of different density, will be drawn up the other parties to the Triple Alliance, 
and to what was already now beginning to be called the Triple Entente. At the proper moment, these seconds or supporters would utter certain cryptic words indicative of their state of mind, and as a consequence of which France or Germany would step back or forward a very small distance, or perhaps move slightly to the right or to the left. When these delicate rectifications in the great balance of Europe, and indeed of the world, had been made, the formidable assembly would withdraw to their own apartments with ceremony and salutations, and congratulate or condole with each other in whispers on the result. We had seen it several times before. But even this process was not free of danger. One must think of the intercourse of the nations in those days, not as if they were chessmen on the board, or puppets dressed in finery and frillings grimacing at each other, but as prodigious organisations of forces, active or latent, like planetary bodies, could not approach each other in space without giving rise to profound magnetic reactions. If they got too near, the lightnings would begin to flash, and beyond a certain point they might be attracted altogether from the orbits in which they were restrained, and draw each other into dire collision. The task of diplomacy was to prevent such disasters, and as long as there was no conscious or subconscious purpose of war in the mind of any power or race, diplomacy would probably succeed. But in such grave and delicate conjunctions, one violent move by any party would rupture and derange the restraints from all, and plunge cosmos into chaos. I thought myself that the Germans had a certain grievance about the original Anglo-French agreement. We had received many conveniences in Egypt. France had gained many great advantages in Morocco. If Germany felt her relative position prejudiced by these arrangements, there was no reason why patiently and amicably she should not advance and press her own point of view. And it seemed to me that Britain, the most withdrawn, the least committed of the great powers, might exercise a mitigating and modifying influence and procure an accommodation. And that, of course, was what we tried to do. But if Germany's intention were malignant, no such process would be of the slightest use. In that event, a very decided word would have to be spoken, and spoken before it was too late. Nor would our withdrawing altogether from the scene have helped matters. Had we done so in our restraining influence would have vanished, and an intenser aggravation of the antagonistic forces must have occurred. Therefore, I read all the papers and telegrams which began to pass with a suspicion, and I could see beneath the calm of Sir Edward Grey a growing, and at some moments a grave anxiety. Situation in the Cabinet The sultry obscurity of the European situation was complicated by the uncertain play of forces within our own council chamber. There again in miniature were reproduced the balances and reserves of the external diplomatic situation. The ministers who were conducting the foreign policy of Britain, with the ponderous trident of sea power towering up behind them, were drawn entirely from the liberal, imperialistic section of the government. They were narrowly watched and kept in equipoise by the radical element, which included the venerable figures of Lord Morley and Lord Lawburn, on whose side the Chancellor of the Exchequer and I had usually leaned. It was clear that this equipoise might easily make it impossible for Great Britain to speak with a decided voice, either on one side or the other, if certain dangerous conditions supervened. We should not, therefore, either keep clear ourselves by withdrawing from the unknown danger, nor be able by resolute action to ward it off in time. In these circumstances, the attitude of the Chancellor of the Exchequer became of peculiar importance. For some weeks, he offered no indication of what his line would be. In our numerous conversations, he gave me the impression of being sometimes on one side and sometimes on the other. But on the morning of July the 21st, when I visited him before the Cabinet, I found a different man. His mind was made up. He saw quite clearly the course to take. He knew what to do, and how, and when to do it. The tenor of his statement to me was that we were drifting into war. He dwelt on the oppressive silence of Germany, so far as we were concerned. He pointed out that Germany was acting as if England did not count in the matter in any way, that she had completely ignored our strong representation, that she was proceeding to put the most severe pressure on France, that a catastrophe might ensue and that if it was to be averted, we must speak with great decision, and we must speak at once. He told me that he was to address the bankers at their annual dinner that evening, and that he intended to make it clear that if Germany meant war, she would find Britain against her. 
He showed me what he had prepared and told me that he would show it to the Prime Minister and Sir Edward Grey after the Cabinet. What would they say? I said that of course they would be very much relieved, and so they were, and so was I. A Mansion House Speech The accession of Mr Lloyd George in foreign policy to the opposite wing of the government was decisive. We were able immediately to pursue a firm and coherent policy. That night at the Bankers' Association, the Chancellor of the Exchequer used the following words. If a situation were to be forced upon us, in which peace could only be preserved by the surrender of the great and beneficent position Britain had won by centuries of heroism and achievement, by allowing Britain to be treated where her interests were vitally affected, as if she were of no account in the Cabinet of Nations, then I say emphatically that peace at that price would be a humiliation intolerable for a great country like ours to endure. His city audience, whose minds were obsessed with the iniquities of the Lloyd George budget and the fearful hardships it had inflicted upon property and wealth, little did they dream of the future, did not comprehend in any way the significance or the importance of what they heard. They took it as if it had been one of the ordinary platitudes of ministerial pronouncements upon foreign affairs. But the chanceries of Europe bounded together. Four days later, at about 5.30 in the afternoon, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and I were walking by the fountains of Buckingham Palace. Hot foot on our track came a messenger. Will the Chancellor of the Exchequer go at once to Sir Edward Grey? Mr Lloyd George stopped abruptly and turning to me said, That's my speech. The Germans may demand my resignation, as they did Del Cassis. I said, that will make you the most popular man in England. The German rejoinder. We returned as fast as we could and found Sir Edward Grey in his room at the House of Commons. His first words were, I have just received a communication from the German ambassador, so stiff that the fleet might be attacked at any moment. I have sent for McKenna to warn him. He then told us briefly of the conversation he had just had with Count Metternich. The ambassador had said that after the speech of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, no explanation could be made by Germany. In acrid terms, he had stated that if France should repel the hand offered her by the Emperor's government, the dignity of Germany would compel her to secure by all means full respect by France. He had then read a long complaint about Mr Lloyd George's speech which to say the least could have been interpreted as a warning to Germany's address, and which as a matter of fact had been interpreted by the presses of Great Britain and France as a warning bordering on menace. Sir Edward Grey had thought it right to reply that the tone of the communication which had just been read to him rendered it inconsistent with the dignity of His Majesty's government, to give explanations with regard to the speech of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The First Lord arrived while we were talking, and a few minutes later hurried off to send the warning orders. Naval Precautions They sound so very cautious and correct, those deadly words. Soft, quiet, voices purring, courteous, grave, exactly measured phrases in large, peaceful rooms. But with less warning, cannons had opened fire, and nations had been struck down by this same Germany. So now the Admiralty wireless whispers threw the ether to the tall mass of ships, and captains paced their decks absorbed in thought. It is nothing. It is less than nothing. It is too foolish, too fantastic to be thought of in the 20th century. Or is it the fire and murder leaping out of the darkness at our throats, torpedoes ripping the bellies of half-awakened ships, a sunrise on a vanished naval supremacy, and an island well guarded hitherto at last defenceless? No, it is nothing. No one would do such things. Civilization has climbed above such perils. The interdependence of nations in trade and traffic, the sense of public law, the Hague Convention, liberal principles, the Labour Party, high finance, Christian charity, common sense have rendered such nightmares impossible. Are you quite sure? It would be a pity to be wrong. Such a mistake could only be made once, once for all. Effect of the Mansion House Speech The Mansion House Speech was a surprise to all countries. It was a thunderclap to the German government. All their information had led them to believe that Mr Lloyd George would head the peace party and that British action would be neutralised. Jumping from one extreme to another, they now assumed that the British cabinet was absolutely united and that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, of all others, 
had been deliberately selected as the most radical minister by the British government to make this pronouncement. They could not understand how their representatives and agents in Great Britain could have been so profoundly misled. Their vexation proved fatal to Count Metternich, and at the first convenient opportunity he was recalled. Here was an ambassador who, after ten years' residence in London, could not even forecast the actions of one of the most powerful ministers on a question of this character. It will be seen from what has been written that this view was hard on Count Metternich. How could he know what Mr Lloyd George was going to do? Until a few hours before his colleagues did not know. Working with him in close association, I did not know. No one knew. Until his mind was definitely made up, he did not know himself. It seems probable now that the Germans did not mean war on this occasion. But they meant to test the ground, and in so doing they were prepared to go to the very edge of the precipice. It is so easy to lose one's balance there. A touch, a gust of wind, a momentary dizziness, and all is precipitated into the abyss. But whether in the heart of the German states there was, or was not a war purpose, before England's part had been publicly declared, there was no such intention afterwards. After the speech of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and its sequel, the German government could not doubt that Great Britain would be against them if a war was forced upon France at this juncture. They did not immediately recede from their position, but they were most careful to avoid any fresh act of provocation, and all their further conduct of the negotiations with France tended to open in one direction or another, paths of accommodation and of retreat. It remained extremely difficult for us to gauge the exact significance of the various points at issue, and throughout the months of July, August and September, the situation continued obscure and oppressive. The slight yet decisive change which came over the character of German diplomacy was scarcely perceptible, and at the same time certain precautionary military measures which were taken behind the German frontiers, so far as they were known to us, had the effect of greatly increasing our anxiety. In consequence, the atmosphere in England became constantly more heavily charged with electricity, as one hot summer's day succeeded another. The Naval Magazines Hitherto as Home Secretary, I had not had any special part to play in this affair, though I had followed it with the utmost attention as a member of the Cabinet. I was now to receive a rude shock. On the afternoon of July the 27th, I attended a garden party at 10 Downing Street. There I met the Chief Commissioner of Police, Sir Edward Henry. We talked about the European situation, and I told him it was serious. He then remarked that by an odd arrangement, the Home Office was responsible, through the Metropolitan Police, for guarding the magazines at Chattenden and Lodge Hill, in which all the reserves of naval cordite were stored. For many years, these magazines had been protected without misadventure by a few constables. I asked what would happen if 20 determined Germans in two or three motor cars arrived, well armed, upon the scene one night. He said they would be able to do what they liked. I quitted the garden party. A few minutes later, I was telephoning from my room in the Home Office to the Admiralty. Who was in charge? The First Lord was with the fleet at Cromarty. The First Sea Lord was inspecting. Both were, of course, quickly accessible by wireless or wire. In the meantime, an Admiral, he shall be nameless, was in control. I demanded Marines at once to guard these magazines, vital to the Royal Navy. I knew there were plenty of Marines in the depots at Chatham and Portsmouth. The Admiral replied over the telephone, that the Admiralty had no responsibility and had no intention of assuming any. And it was clear from his manner that he resented the intrusion of an alarmist civilian minister. You refuse then to send the Marines? After some hesitation he replied, I refuse. I replaced the receiver and rang up the war office. Mr Haldane was there. I told him that I was reinforcing and arming the police at night and asked for a company of infantry for each magazine in addition. In a few minutes, the orders were given. In a few hours, the troops had moved. By the next day, the cordite reserves of the Navy were safe. The incident was a small one, and perhaps my fears were unfounded. But once one had begun to view the situation in this light, it became impossible to think of anything else. All around flowed the busy life of peaceful, unsuspecting, easy-going Britain. The streets were thronged with men and women utterly devoid of any sense of danger from abroad. For nearly a thousand years, except upon English invitation, no foreign army had landed on British soil. For a hundred years, 
the safety of the homeland had never been threatened. They went about their business, their sport, their class and party fights year after year, generation after generation, in perfect confidence and considerable ignorance. All their arrangements were the result of long peace. Most of them had been incredulous. Many would have been very angry if they had been told that we might be near a tremendous war, and that perhaps within the city of London, which harboured confidingly visitors from every land, resolute foreigners might be aiming a deadly blow at the strength of the one great weapon and shield in which we trusted. Vulnerable Points I began to make inquiries about vulnerable points. I found the far-seeing Captain Hankey, then Assistant Secretary to the Committee of Imperial Defence, already on the move classifying them for the war book, which project had actually been launched. I inquired further about sabotage and espionage and counter-espionage. I came in touch with other officers working very quietly and very earnestly, but in a small way and with small means. I was told about German spies and agents in the various British ports. Hitherto, the Home Secretary had to sign a warrant when it was necessary to examine any particular letter passing through the Royal Mails. I now signed general warrants authorising the examination of all the correspondence of particular people upon a list in which additions were continually made. This soon disclosed a regular and extensive system of German-paid British agents. It was only in a very small part of the field of preparation that the Home Secretary had any official duty of interference, but once I got drawn in, it dominated all other interests in my mind. For seven years I was to think of little else. Liberal politics, the people's budget, free trade, peace, retrenchment and reform. All the war cries of our election struggles began to seem unreal in the presence of this new preoccupation. Only Ireland held her place among the grim realities which came into view. No doubt other ministers had similar mental experiences. I am telling my own tale. Sir Henry Wilson I now began to make an intensive study of the military position in Europe. I read everything with which I was supplied. I spent many hours in argument and discussion. The Secretary of State for War told his officers to tell me everything I wanted to know. The Chief of the General Staff, Sir William Nicholson, was an old friend of mine. I had served with him as a young officer on Sir William Lockhart's staff at the end of the Tira expedition in 1898. He wrote fine, broad appreciations and preached a clear and steady doctrine. But the man from whom I learned most was the Director of Military Operations, General Wilson, afterwards Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson. He had acquired an immense, and I expect, an unequalled volume of knowledge about the continent. He knew the French army thoroughly. He was deeply in the secrets of the French General Staff. He had been head of the British Staff College. For years he had been labouring with one object, that if war came, we should act immediately on the side of France. He was sure that war would come sooner or later. All the threads of military information were in his hands. The whole wall of his small room was covered by a gigantic map of Belgium, across which every practicable road by which the German armies could march for the invasion of France were painted clearly. All his holidays he spent examining these roads and the surrounding country. He could not do much in Germany. The Germans knew him too well. A talk with the German ambassador. One night the German ambassador, still Count Metternich, whom I had known for ten years, asked me to dine with him. We were alone, and a famous hock from the Emperor's cellars was produced. We had a long talk about Germany, and how she had grown great, about Napoleon and the part he had played in uniting her, about the Franco-German war, and how it began and how it ended. I said what a pity it was that Bismarck had allowed himself to be forced by the soldiers into taking Lorraine, and how Alsace and Lorraine lay at the root of all the European armaments and rival combinations. He said these had been German provinces from remote antiquity, until one day in profound peace Louis XIV had pranced over the frontier and seized them. I said their sympathies were French. He said they were mixed. I said that anyhow it kept the whole thing alive. France could never forget her lost provinces, and they never ceased to call to her. The conversation passed to a kindred but more critical subject. Was he anxious about the present situation? He said people were trying to ring Germany round, and put her in a net, and that she was a strong animal to put in a net. I said, how could she be netted when she had an alliance with two other first-class powers, 
Austria-Hungary and Italy. We had often stood quite alone for years at a time without getting flustered. He said it was very different business for an island. But when you had been marched through and pillaged and oppressed so often, and had only the breasts of your soldiers to stand between you and invasion, it ate into your soul. I said that Germany was frightened of nobody, and that everybody was frightened of her. Then he came to the navy. Surely, I said, it was a great mistake for Germany to try to rival Britain on the seas. She would never catch us up. We should build two to one or more if necessary, and at every stage antagonism would grow between the countries. Radicals and Tories, whatever they might say about each other, were all agreed on that. No British government which jeopardised our naval supremacy could live. He said Mr Lloyd George had told him very much the same thing, but the Germans had no thought of naval supremacy. All they wanted was a fleet to protect their commerce and their colonies. I asked what was the use of having a weaker fleet. It was only another hostage to fortune. He said that the Emperor was profoundly attached to his fleet and that it was his own creation. I could not resist saying that Moltke had pronounced a very different opinion of Germany's true interest. I have recorded these notes of a pleasant though careful conversation, not because they are of any importance, but because they help to show the different points of view. I learned afterwards that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, in similar circumstances, had spoken more explicitly, saying that he would raise a hundred millions in a single year for the British Navy, if its supremacy were really challenged. Count Metternich Count Metternich was a very honourable man, serving his master faithfully, but labouring to preserve peace, especially peace between England and Germany. I have heard that on one occasion at Berlin, in a throng of generals and princes, someone had said that the British fleet would one day make a surprise and unprovoked attack upon Germany. Whereupon the ambassador had replied that he had lived in England for nearly ten years, and he knew that such a thing was absolutely impossible. On this remark being received, with obvious incredulity, he had drawn himself up and observed that he made it on the honour of a German officer, and that he would answer for its truth with his honour. This for a moment had quelled the company. It is customary for thoughtless people to jeer at the old diplomacy, and to pretend that wars arise out of its secret machinations. When one looks at the petty subjects which have led to wars between great countries and to so many disputes, it is easy to be misled in this way. Of course, such small matters are only the symptoms of the dangerous disease and are only important for that reason. Behind them lie the interests, the passions and the destiny of mighty races of men, and long antagonisms express themselves in trifles. Great commotions, it was said of old, arise out of small things but not concerning small things. The old diplomacy did its best to render harmless the small things. It could not do more. Nevertheless, a war postponed may be a war averted. Circumstances change. Combinations change. New groupings arrive. New groupings arise. Old interests are superseded by new. Many quarrels that might have led to war have been adjusted by the old diplomacy of Europe and have, in Lord Melbourne's phrase, blown over. If the nations of the world, while the sense of their awful experiences is still fresh upon them, are able to devise broader and deeper guarantees of peace, and build their houses on a surer foundation of brotherhood and interdependence, they will still require the courtly manners, the polite and measured phrases, the imperturbable demeanour, the secrecy and discretion of the old diplomatists of Europe. This is, however, a digression. Sir Henry Wilson's Forecast On August the 23rd, after Parliament had risen and ministers had dispersed, the Prime Minister conveyed very secretly a special meeting of the Committee of Imperial Defence. He summoned the ministers specially concerned with the foreign situation and with the fighting services, including, of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. There were also the principal officers of the Army and Navy. I was invited to attend, though the Home Office was not directly concerned. We sat all day. In the morning, the Army told its tale. In the afternoon, the Navy. General Wilson, as Director of Military Operations, stated the views of the General Staff. Standing by his enormous map, specially transported for the purpose, he unfolded, with what proved afterwards to be extreme accuracy, the German plan for attacking France in the event of a war between Germany and Austria on the one hand, and France and Russia on the other. It was briefly as follows. In the first place, 
the Germans would turn nearly four-fifths of their strength against France, and leave only one-fifth to contain Russia. The German armies would draw up on a line from the Swiss frontier to aix la chapelle They would then swing their right wing through Belgium, thus turning the line of fortresses by which the eastern frontiers of France were protected. This enormous swinging movement of the German right arm would require every road which led through Belgium, from Luxembourg to the Belgian Meuse. There were 15 of these roads, and three divisions would probably march along each. The Belgian Meuse flowed parallel to the march of these divisions, and protected their right flank. Along this river were three important fortified passages or bridgeheads. First, near Germany, Liège, the last near France, Namur, and midway between the two, the Fort of Hoy. Now arose the question, would the Germans, after seizing these bridgeheads, confine themselves to the eastern side of the Belgian Meuse, and use the river for their protection? Or would they be able to spare and bring a large body of troops to prolong their turning movement west of the Belgian Meuse, and thus advance beyond it instead of inside it? This was the only part of their plan which could not be foreseen. Would they avoid the western side of the Belgian Meuse altogether? Would they skim along it with a cavalry force only, or would they march infantry divisions, or even army corps, west of that river? When the time came, as we now know, they marched two whole armies. At that date, however, the most sombre apprehension did not exceed one, or at the outside, two army corps. Overwhelming detailed evidence was adduced to show that the Germans had made every preparation for marching through Belgium. The great military camps in close proximity to the frontier, the enormous depots, the reticulation of railways, the endless sidings, revealed with the utmost clearness and beyond all doubt their design. Liège would be taken within a few hours of the declaration of war, possibly even before it, by the rush of motorcars and cyclists from the camp at Elsenborn. That camp was now, August 1911, crowded with troops, and inquisitive persons and ordinary country folk were already being roughly turned back and prevented from approaching it. What would Belgium do in the face of such an onslaught? Nothing could save Liège, but French troops might reach Namur in time to aid in its defence. For the rest, the Belgian army, assuming that Belgium resisted the invader, would withdraw into the great entrenched camp and fortress of Antwerp. This extensive area, intersected by a tangle of rivers and canals, and defended by three circles of forts, would become the last refuge of the Belgian monarchy and people. The position of Holland was also examined. It was not thought that the Germans would overrun Holland as they would Belgium, but they might find it very convenient to march across the curiously shaped projection of Holland which lay between Germany and Belgium, and which in the British General Staff parlance at that time was called the Maastricht Appendix. They would certainly do this if any considerable body of their troops were thrown west of the Belgian Meuse. The French plans for meeting this formidable situation were not told in detail to us, but it was clear that they hoped to forestall and rupture the German enveloping movement by a counter-offensive of their own on the greatest scale. The numbers of divisions available on both sides and on all fronts when mobilisation was completed were estimated as French, 85, German, 110. It was asserted that if the six British divisions were sent to take position on the extreme French left, immediately war was declared, the chances of repulsing the Germans in the first great shock of battle were favourable. Every French soldier would fight with double confidence if he knew he was not fighting alone. Upon the strength of Russia, General Wilson spoke with great foresight, and the account which he gave of the slow mobilisation of the Russian army swept away many illusions. It seemed incredible that Germany should be content to leave scarcely a score of divisions to make head against the might of Russia. But the British general staff considered that such a decision would be well founded. We shall see presently how the loyalty of Russia and of the Tsar found the means by prodigious sacrifices to call back to the east vital portions of the German army at the supreme moment. Such action could not be foreseen then, and most people have forgotten it now. Admiralty Views There was of course a considerable discussion and much questioning before we adjourned at two o'clock. When we began again at three, it was the turn of the Admiralty, and the first Sea Lord, Sir Arthur Wilson, with another map, expanded his views of the policy we should pursue in the event of our being involved in such a war. He did not reveal the Admiralty war plans, those he kept locked away in his own brain, 
but he indicated that they embodied the principle of a close blockade of the enemy ports. It was very soon apparent that a profound difference existed between the War Office and the Admiralty view. In the main, the Admiralty thought that we should confine our efforts to the sea, that if our small army was sent to the continent, it would be swallowed up amongst the immense hosts conflicting there, whereas if kept in ships or ready to embark for counterstrokes upon the German coast, it would draw off more than its own weight of numbers from the German fighting line. This view, which was violently combated by the generals, did not commend itself to the bulk of those present, and on many points of detail, connected with the landings of these troops, the military and naval authorities were found in complete discord. The serious agreement between the military and naval staffs in such critical times, upon fundamental issues, was the immediate cause of my going to the Admiralty. After the council had separated, Mr Haldane intimated to the Prime Minister that he would not continue to be responsible for the War Office unless a Board of Admiralty was called into being which would work in full harmony with the War Office plans and would begin the organisation of a proper naval war staff. Of course, I knew nothing of this, but it was destined soon to affect my fortunes in a definite manner. I thought that the general staff took too sanguine a view of the French army. Knowing their partisanship for France, I feared the wish was farther to the fort. It was inevitable that British military men, ardently desirous of seeing their country intervene on the side of France, and convinced that the destruction of France by Germany would imperil the whole future of Great Britain, should be inclined to overrate the relative power of the French army and accord it brighter prospects than were actually justified. The bulk of their information was derived from French sources. The French general staff were resolute and hopeful. The principle of the offensive was the foundation of their military art and the mainspring of the French soldier. Although, according to the best information, the French pre-war army, when fully mobilised, was only three-fourths as strong as the German pre-war army, the French mobilisation from the 9th to the 13th day yielded a superior strength on the fighting front. High hopes were entertained by the French generals that a daring seizure of the initiative and a vigorous offensive into Alsace-Lorraine would have the effect of rupturing the carefully thought-out German plans of marching through Belgium onto Paris. These hopes were reflected in the British General Staff appreciations. My Memorandum of August the 13th I could not share them. I had therefore prepared a memorandum for the Committee of Imperial Defence, which embodied my own conclusions upon all I had learned from the General Staff. It was dated August the 13th, 1911. It was, of course, only an attempt to pierce the veil of the future, to conjure up in the mind a vast imaginary situation, to balance the incalculable, to weigh the imponderable. I name the 20th day of mobilisation as the date by which the French armies will have been driven from the line of the Meurs and will be falling back on Paris and the South, and the 40th day as that by which Germany should be extended at full strain both internally and on her war fronts, and that opportunities for the decisive trial of strength may then occur. I am quite free to admit that these were not intended to be precise dates, but as guides to show what would probably happen. In fact, however, both these forecasts were almost literally verified three years later by the event. I reprinted this memorandum on the 2nd of September 1914, in order to encourage my colleagues with the hope that if the unfavourable prediction about the 20th day had been borne out, so also would be the favourable prediction about the 40th day, and so indeed it was. Military Aspects of the Continental Problem Memorandum by Mr Churchill The following notes have been written on the assumption that a decision has been arrived at to employ a British military force on the continent of Europe. It does not prejudge that decision in any way. It is assumed that an alliance exists between Great Britain, France and Russia, and that these powers are attacked by Germany and Austria. 1. The decisive military operations will be those between France and Germany. The German army is at least equal in quality to the French, and mobilises 2.2 million against 1.7 million. The French must therefore seek for a situation of more equality. This can be found either before the full strength of the Germans have been brought to bear, or after the German army has been extended. The first might be reached between the 9th and 13th days, the latter about the 40th. 2. 
The fact that during a few days in the mobilisation period, the French are equal or temporarily superior on the frontiers is of no significance, except on the assumption that France contemplates adopting a strategic offensive. The Germans will not choose the days when they themselves have least superiority for a general advance, and if the French advance, they lose at once all the advantages of their own internal communications, and by moving towards the advancing German reinforcements, annul any numerical advantage they may for the moment possess. The French, therefore, have at the beginning of the war no option but to remain on the defensive, both upon their fortress line and behind the Belgian frontier. And the choice of the day when the first main collision will commence rests with the Germans, who must be credited with the wisdom of choosing the best possible day, and cannot be forced into decisive action against their will, except by some reckless and unjustifiable movement on the part of the French. 3. A prudent survey of chances from the British point of view ought to contemplate that, when the German advance decisively begins, it will be backed by sufficient preponderance of force and developed on a sufficiently wide front to compel the French armies to retreat from their position behind the Belgian frontier, even though they may hold the gaps between the fortresses on the verdun belfort front. No doubt a series of great battles will have been fought with varying local fortunes, and there is always a possibility of a heavy German check. But even if the Germans were brought to a standstill, the French would not be strong enough to advance in their own turn. And in any case, we ought not to count on this. The balance of probability is that by the 20th day, the French armies will have been driven from the line of the Meuse and will be falling back on Paris and the south. All plans based upon the opposite assumption ask too much of fortune. 4. This is not to exclude the plan of using four or six British divisions in these great initial operations. Such a force is a material factor of significance. Its value to the French would be out of all proportion to its numerical strength. It would encourage every French soldier and make the task of the Germans enforcing the frontier much more costly. But the question which is of most practical consequence to us is what is to happen after the frontier has been forced and the invasion of France has begun. France will not be able to end the war successfully by any action on the frontiers. She will not be strong enough to invade Germany. Her only chance is to conquer Germany in France. It is this problem which should be studied before any final decision is taken. 5. The German armies in advancing through Belgium and onwards into France will be relatively weakened by all or any of the following causes. By the greater losses incidental to the offensive, especially if they have tested unsuccessfully the French fortress lines. By the greater employment of soldiers necessitated by acting on exterior lines by having to guard their communications through Belgium and France, especially from the sea flank, by having to invest Paris, requiring at least 500,000 men against 100,000, and to besiege or mask other places, especially along the seaboard, by the arrival of the British army, by the growing pressure of Russia from the 30th day, and generally by the bad strategic situation to which their right-handed advance will commit them as it becomes pronounced. All these factors will operate increasingly in proportion as the Germans advance and every day that passes. 6. Time is also required for the naval blockade to make itself felt on German commerce, industry and food prices, as described in the Admiralty Memorandum, and for these again to react on German credit and finances already burdened with the prodigious daily cost of the war. All these pressures will develop simultaneously and progressively. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, has drawn special attention to this and to the very light structure of German industry and economic organisations. 7. By the 40th day, Germany should be extended at full strain both internally and on her war fronts. And this strain will become daily more severe and ultimately overwhelming, unless it is relieved by decisive victories in France. If the French army has not been squandered by precipitate or desperate actions, the balance of forces should be favourable after the 40th day, and will improve steadily as time passes. For the German armies will be confronted with a situation which combines an ever-growing need for a successful offensive, with a battlefront which tends continually towards numerical equality. Opportunities for the decisive trial of strength may then occur. After this, the conference separated, 
apprehension lay heavy on the minds of all who had participated in it. Continued Anxiety The War Office hummed with secrets in those days. Not the slightest overt action could be taken, but every preparation by Thorfort was made and every detail was worked out on paper. The railway timetables, or graphics as they were called, of the movement of every battalion, even when they were to drink their coffee, were prepared and settled. Thousands of maps of northern France and Belgium were printed. The cavalry manoeuvres were postponed, on account of the scarcity of water in Wiltshire and the neighbouring counties. The press fiercely divided on party lines, overwhelmingly pacific in tendency, without censorship, without compulsion, observed a steady universal reticence. Not a word broke the long-drawn oppressive silence. The great railway strike came to an end with mysterious suddenness. Mutual concessions were made by masters and men after hearing a confidential statement from the Chancellor of the Exchequer. In the middle of August, I went to the country for a few days. I could not think of anything else but the peril of war. I did my other work as it came along, but there was only one field of interest fiercely illuminated in my mind. My letter to Sir Edward Grey. From the smiling country which stretches around Mel's, I wrote the following letter to Sir Edward Grey. It speaks for itself. 30th of August, 1911. Perhaps a time is coming when decisive action will be necessary. Please consider the following policy for use if and when Morocco negotiations fail. Propose to France and Russia a triple alliance to safeguard an independence of Belgium, Holland and Denmark. Tell Belgium that if her neutrality is violated, we are prepared to come to her aid and to make an alliance with France and Russia to guarantee her independence. Tell her that we will take whatever military steps will be most effective for that purpose. But the Belgian army must take the field in concert with the British and French armies, and Belgium must immediately garrison properly Liège and Namur, otherwise we cannot be responsible for her fate. Offer the same guarantee both to Holland and to Denmark, contingent upon their making their utmost exertions. We should, if necessary, aid Belgium to defend Antwerp and to feed that fortress and any army based on it. We should be prepared at the proper moment to put extreme pressure on the Dutch to keep the Scheldt open for all purposes. If the Dutch close the Scheldt, we should retaliate by a blockade of the Rhine. It is very important to us to be able to blockade the Rhine, and it gets more important as the war goes on. On the other hand, if the Germans do not use the Maastricht Appendix in the first days of the war, they will not want it at all. Let me add that I am not at all convinced about the wisdom of a close blockade, and I do not like the Admiralty statement. If the French send cruisers to Mogador and Safi, I am of opinion that we should, for our part, move our main fleet to the north of Scotland in its war station. Our interests are European and not Moroccan. The significance of the movement would be just as great if we sent our two ships with the French. Please let me know when you'll be in London, and will you kindly send this letter on to the Prime Minister? My views underwent no change in the three years of peace that followed. On the contrary, they were confirmed and amplified by everything I learned. In some respects, as in the abolition of the plan of close blockade and the sending of the fleet to its war station, I was able to carry them out. In other cases, such as the defence of Antwerp, I had not the power to do in time what I believed to be equally necessary. But I tried my best, not as has frequently been proclaimed upon a foolish impulse, but in pursuance of convictions reached by pondering and study. I could not help feeling a strong confidence in the truth of these convictions, when I saw how several of them were justified, one after the other, in that terrible and unparalleled period of convulsion. I had no doubts whatever what ought to be done in certain matters, and my only difficulty was to persuade or induce others. The End of the Crisis The Agadir Crisis came however peacefully to an end. It terminated in the diplomatic rebuff of Germany. Once more she had disturbed all Europe by a sudden and menacing gesture. Once more she had used the hardest threats towards France. For the first time she had made British statesmen feel that sense of direct contact with the war peril, which was never absent from continental minds. The French, however, offered concessions and compensations. An intricate negotiation about the frontiers of French and German territory in West Africa, in which the Bec de Canard played an important part, had resulted in an agreement between the two principles. To us it seemed that France had won a considerable advantage. She was not, however, particularly pleased. 
Her Prime Minister, Monsieur Cao, who had presided during those anxious days, was dismissed from office on grounds which at the time was very difficult to appreciate here, but which viewed in the light of subsequent events can more easily be understood. The tension in German governing circles must have been very great. The German colonial secretary, von Lindequist, resigned rather than sign the agreement. There is no doubt that deep and violent passions of humiliation and resentment were coursing beneath the glittering uniforms which thronged the palaces through which the Kaiser moved. And of these passions, the crown prince made himself the exponent. The world has heaped unbounded execrations upon this unlucky being. He was probably in fact no better and no worse than the average young cavalry subaltern who had not been through the ordinary mill at a public school, nor had to think about earning his living. He had a considerable personal charm, which he lavished principally upon the fair sex, but which in darker days had captivated the juvenile population of Waringen. His flattered head was turned by the burning eyes and guttural words of great captains and statesmen and party leaders. He therefore threw himself forward into this strong, favouring current and became a power, or rather the focus of a power, with which the Kaiser was forced to reckon. Germany once more proceeded to increase her armaments by land and sea. It was a question, writes von Tirpitz, of our keeping our nerve, continuing to arm on a grand scale, avoiding all provocation, and waiting without anxiety until our sea power was established, and force the English to let us breathe in peace. Only to breathe in peace, what fearful apparatus was required to secure this simple act of respiration? Reactions in France We must now trace the reaction of these events in France. Early in 1911, General Michel, Vice President of the Superior Council of War and Commander-in-Chief Designate of the French Army in the event of war, had drawn up a report upon the plan of campaign. He declared that Germany would certainly attack France through Belgium, that her turning movement would not be limited to the southern side of the Belgian Meuse, but would extend far beyond it, comprising Brussels and Antwerp in its scope. He affirmed that the German general staff would use immediately not only their 21 active army corps, but in addition the greater part of the 21 reserve corps, which it was known they intended to form on general mobilisation. France should therefore be prepared to meet an immense turning movement through Belgium and a hostile army which would comprise at the outset the greater part of 42 army corps. To confront this invasion, he proposed that the French should organise and use a large proportion of their own reserves from the very beginning. For this purpose, he desired to create a reserve formation at the side of each active formation and to make both units take the field together under the officer commanding the active unit. By this means, the strength of the French army on mobilisation would be raised from 1.3 million to 2 million, and the German invading army would be confronted with at least equal numbers. Many of the French corps would be raised to 70,000 men, and most of the regiments would become brigades of six battalions. These forces General Michel next proceeded to distribute. He proposed to place his greatest mass, nearly 500,000 strong, between Lille and Avesnes, to counter the main strength of the German turning movement. He placed a second mass of 300,000 men on the right of the first between Herson and Rafael. He assigned 220,000 men for the garrison of Paris, which was also to act as a general reserve. His remaining troops were disposed along the eastern frontier. Such was the plan in 1911 of the leading French soldier. General Michel's report rejected. These ideas ran directly counter to the mainstream of French military thought. The French general staff did not believe that Germany would make a turning movement through Belgium, certainly not through northern Belgium. They did not believe that the Germans would use their reserve formations in the opening battles. They did not believe that reserve formations could possibly be made capable of taking part in the struggle until after a prolonged period of training. They held on the contrary that the Germans, using only their active army, would attack with extreme rapidity and must be met and forestalled by a French counterfrust across the eastern frontier. For this purpose, the French should be organised with as large a proportion of soldiers actually serving and as few reservists as possible. And with this end in view, they demanded the institution of the three years service law, 
which would ensure the presence of at least two complete contingents of young soldiers. The dominant spirits in the French staff, apart from their chief, belonged to the offensive school, of whom the most active apostle was Colonel de Grand Maison, and believed ardently that victory could be compelled from the first moment by a vehement and furious rush upon the foe. This collision of opinion was fatal to General Michel. It may be that his personality and temperament were not equal to the profound and penetrating justice of his ideas. Such discrepancies had often marred true policies. An overwhelming combination was formed against him by his colleagues on the Council of War. During the tension of Agadir, the issue reached a head. The new Minister of War, Colonel Massimi, insisted upon a discussion of the Michel scheme in full council. The Vice President found himself alone. Almost every other general declared his direct disagreement. In consequence of this, he was a few days later informed by the War Minister that he did not possess the confidence of the French army, and on July the 23rd, he resigned the position of Vice President of the War Council. Joffre It had been intended by the government that Michel should be succeeded either by Gallieni or Pau, but Pau made claims to the appointing of general officers, which the minister would not accept. His nomination was not proceeded with ostensibly on the score of his age, and this pretext once given was still more valid against Gallieni, who was older. It was in these circumstances that the choice fell upon General Joff. Joff was an engineering officer, who after various employments in Madagascar under Gallieni and in Morocco, had gained a reputation as a well-balanced, silent, solid man, and who in 1911 occupied a seat on the Superior Council of War. It would have been difficult to find any figure more unlike the British idea of a Frenchman than this bull-headed, broad-shouldered, slow-thinking, phlegmatic, bucolic personage. Nor would it have been easy to find a type which at the first view would have seemed less suited to weave or unravel the profound and gigantic webs of modern war. He was the junior member of the War Council. He had never commanded an army, nor directed great manoeuvres even in a war game. In such exercises, he had played the part of an inspector general of the lines of communication, and to this post he was at the time assigned on mobilisation. Joff received the proposal for his tremendous appointment with misgiving and embarrassment, which were both natural and creditable. His reluctances were overcome by the assurance that General de Castelnau, who was deeply versed in the plans and theories of the French staff and in the great operations of war, would be at his special disposal. Joff, therefore, assumed power as the nominee of the dominant elements in the French staff and as the exponent of their doctrines. To this concept, he remained constantly loyal and the immense disasters which France was destined to suffer three years later became from that moment almost inevitable. General Joff's qualities, however, fitted him to render most useful service to the various fleeting French administrations which preceded the conflict. He represented the embodied stability in a world of change, and impartiality in a world of faction. He was a good Republican, with a definite political view without being a political soldier or one who dealt in intrigue. No one could suspect him of religion, but neither on the other hand could anyone accuse him of favouring atheist generals at the expense of Catholics. Here at any rate was something for France, with her politicians chattering, fuming and frothing along to Armageddon, to rest her hand upon. For nearly three years, and under successive governments, Joff continued to hold his post, and we are assured that his advice on technical matters was almost always taken by the various ministers who flitted across the darkening scene. He served under Caillot and Messimy. He served under Poincaré and Millerand. He served under Brion and Etienne. He was still serving under Viviani and Messimy again when the explosion came. Lastly, let us return to Great Britain. In October, Mr Asquith invited me to stay with him in Scotland. The day after I arrived there, on our way home from the links, he asked me quite abruptly whether I would like to go to the Admiralty. He had put the same question to me when he had first become Prime Minister. This time I had no doubt what to answer. All my mind was full of the dangers of war. I accepted with alacrity. I said, indeed I would. He said that Mr Haldane was coming to see him the next day and we would talk it over together. But I saw that his mind was made up. 
The fading light of evening disclosed in, and the far distance the silhouettes of two battleships steaming slowly out of the Firth of Forth. They seemed invested with a new significance. That night, when I went to bed, I saw a large Bible lying on a table in my bedroom. My mind was dominated by the news I had received of the complete change in my station and of the task entrusted to me. I thought of the peril of Britain, peace-loving, unthinking, little prepared, of her power and virtue, and of her mission of good sense and fair play. I thought of mighty Germany towering up in the splendour of her imperial state, and delving down in her profound, cold, patience, ruthless calculations. I thought of the army corps I had watched tramp past, wave after wave of valiant manhood, at the Breslau manoeuvres in 1907 of the thousands of strong horses dragging cannon and great howitzers up the ridge and along the roads around Würzburg in 1910. I thought of German education and thoroughness and all that their triumphs in science and philosophy implied. I thought of the sudden and successful wars by which her power had been set up.